In our scripture reading for this morning, Paul is giving a lot of instruction that is still constantly in need in the church. Then you read a little bit about the church at the time that he's writing, and in a lot of ways, the environment is really different too. You can kind of tell as Paul writes to churches throughout the ancient world that a lot of them have the same problems we have in, uh, in terms of needing encouragement in some of the same ways. If you listened closely to the scripture reading, you might have heard some similar parts to Paul's analogy of us being members of the body of Christ that he keeps writing to these churches. You may have heard some of what you already know of the fruits of the Spirit that he's already repeated to a lot of these churches. Or you may have heard things against bearing false witness against your neighbor and theft, which remind you of things that we read from the Ten Commandments. It seems like humans who live in a community of faith from Moses to Paul to us today have always needed encouragement to stop being selfish and to take, take care of other people. We need the reminders, as Jesus said, to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And as Paul said, to value each other as parts of the same body of Christ. We all have different gifts and challenges, and it's actually good that we need each other and take care of each other. Okay, let's start at the very beginning. Julie Andrews once told me that that's a very good place to start. <laughs> When you preach, you begin with Ephesians 4, where Paul says that we are not to bear false witness against our neighbor. A lot of translations of what is also from the Ten Commandments, that uh, a lot of translations use thou shalt not lie, which we have similar language in Exodus, but there's a, a huge difference between thou shalt not lie and do not bear witness, bear false witness against your neighbor. No, I'm not endorsing lying, but specifically, we are told not to say something which will bring judgment upon other people. False accusations, or as it would be called in our modern courts, perjury. Paul then reiterates that we are all members of one body. This whole passage, it seems, is an instruction on how to be in community with each other well. He tells us not to act in anger, nor to let the sun set on an argument, which is something that a whole lot of us are told in couples therapy in preparation for marriage. My question here, though, is how do we avoid acting in anger while not letting the sun set on an argument? I mean, sometimes you need to settle down after an argument so you don't speak out in anger against someone, right? A lot of commandments seem really hard to do at the same time as each other. So I think it's really important to think about how we can do the best we can while honoring God and each other, rather than figuring out how to obey the exact letter of the law. And here's my Jesus story to back that up. In Matthew 12, Jesus said, Jesus and his disciples are walking through a field on the Sabbath, and some of them pick a little bit of the tops of the grain to eat as they're passing by. And the Pharisees somehow always have this way of lurking in the shadows and popping out whenever the disciples do something they don't like and going, ha, I caught you sinning. More accurately, the Pharisees said that the disciples are not doing what is holy on the Sabbath by picking grain. And okay, you're not supposed to do work on the Sabbath, which includes picking grain as a job or as labor, but the law wasn't intended to keep people from eating. Duh. Jesus reminds the Pharisees of a story of David and his followers eating consecrated bread because, of course, there was a circumstance in which people... There's a reverb on that. People needed to be fed. <laughs> People needed to be fed. The command which Jesus... I'm going to get used to this environment eventually. Okay. <laughs> the command which Jesus said was the most important... The, uh, 
The command which Jesus said was the most important was to love. Specifically, love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Upon this commandment, to love all, hangs all of the law and the prophets. If this kind of story took place today, instead of telling the Pharisees not to tell people, not to let people pick their own food on the Sabbath, Jesus might tell us to feed people who are hungry, even when they haven't filled out the paperwork and been registered into our systems yet. Everything takes paperwork and records now, and some people just need to be helped when they're hungry. Or need shelter. Or human rights and dignity. I saw this meme, um, and I apologize, it's a, a tad bit sacrilegious, and I hope you'll take the spirit of it and not think that Jesus would actually talk this way, but I saw this meme of Jesus preaching to people, and he says, love your neighbor, and somebody raises their hand and goes, but what if they have tattoos or they're transgender? And Jesus said, yes, even if they ask stupid questions. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Jesus had a lot more tact and patience than I do, but I enjoyed reading that anyway. Moving on, Paul told us to have no unwholesome talk, only saying what is helpful in building up others. At summer camp, we call this milk and bricks, because milk helps build strong people, and bricks helps build strong buildings. If we heard a disparaging remark about someone or some unhealthy gossip, we'd say, milk and bricks, y'all. I know it's hard. I think we need a lot more. Man, Bob totally rock, rock, uh, rocked the socks off of that Zoom meeting on Tuesday night. And a little less, oh man, Gavin needs to stop pretending he knows how to play the guitar. I haven't actually heard people saying that. I'm just not going to say anything negative about anyone else. The next bit of this passage ties a whole lot of the previous sections together. Paul tells us to rid ourselves of malice, rage, and bitterness, and be kind to each other, forgiving one another as Christ forgave you. I think, or maybe I'm projecting a little bit upon the Ephesians, that there must have been some sort of rage concerning injustice among the Ephesians, which caused them to bear false witness against each other. Because Paul gets really specific there. That, or maybe that was the way the ancient world just was. Essentially, though, Paul is telling them to be good neighbors to each other. Be a community which builds each other up instead of knocking each other down so we can all climb onto each other. Uplifting speech is supposed to replace any false witness because we are all members of each other, of one body. He gives us a few replacements in this scripture. Replace slander with uplifting words. Replace vengeance with forgiveness. Then he launches into this idea of the reformed thief. I like this part especially because as we're talking about being part of the body of Christ, he talks about our actual body parts, our hands. And that having given up our old ways, we are called to something better. Namely, our hands, which may have been used to steal, are now used to produ produce, to work, so that we can be generous in our abundance. This part is confusing because it seems to condemn living off of the labor of others as well as hoarding one's own wealth without sharing it with your community. Now, I think this is one of those places where I think if you didn't follow the instruction to look for the spirit instead of the letter of the law, you could get trapped into thinking that this is a condemnation of the poor for being lazy or a condemnation of the rich for taking all this stuff for yourself. And yes, you could make the case that the thief could be blue or white collar or government, but seeing as the point of the passage was your community, how do we take this as an instruction for the whole community? 
It's to care enough to reach for the poor when they're down and to be humble enough to work when it's you who is down. We are all poor at some point and we are all ahead of others at some point. And if we're being honest, most of us at some point blamed the poor or the rich for our problems as a community. And that's not the point, is it, to blame people? Because Jesus made sure that the hungry were fed no matter how much we judged them. Jesus gave mercy and healing to the family of the Roman centurion no matter how hard the Pharisees judged him. This passage is a great example of how our bodies are a great metaphor for Christ's body in the world. See, the hands of someone who has been a thief is transformed with the Holy Spirit and wants to love and take care of their community. Is how we are like the hands and feet of Christ in the world. The same hands which stole goods or attacked victims or wrote hate speech have been transformed by a spirit of love to act in service and healing and in love. We are new creations, and I like us better with that spirit of love. Amen? Now, when you're a preacher, you start to remember words that you've preached on and how they connect to something you're prepping for this week's sermon. So as I'm reading in Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus about being productive and caring for your neighbors and your community, I'm also flashing back to things Jesus said that make that Hard to compromise. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus tells us to consider the flowers of the field, that they neither labor nor spin, and God provides for them. If God loves you infinitely, how much more will God provide for you? The birds in the sky don't worry about how they will gather and what they will eat, and God provides for them. So I'm getting from Paul's recommendations for community that I need to work to take care of my community without collecting riches for myself. And I'm getting from Jesus that I don't need to worry about what I'll eat or what I'll wear. What's the healthy in-between there? Community. Love. Being a part of something that makes you not worry because together we'll provide for each other when we're down and share when we're up. And lastly, for chapter four, and no, we're not done yet because there's a little more in chapter five because, you know, we're reading Paul. We are supposed to forgive each other. We have to forgive each other, especially when we're, giving, when we're given such confusing, sometimes seemingly contradictory instructions. Paul is sometimes the theological equivalent of if you got a physical model of quantum mechanics with instructions from Ikea. Every once in a while, it's like, this bolt was supposed to go somewhere in there, and I don't know where I was supposed to use an Allen wrench, and it changes when I observe it. That was geeky even for me. <laughs> Paul tells us to forgive. Most anything that Paul tells us needs to be supplemented with wisdom and guidance from Jesus. And I think he would agree with that because he says that we are supposed to forgive as Jesus forgave us. Remember Jesus' example of forgiveness. Remember Jesus' instruction not to worry. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit as an advocate who lives within us and guides us, replacing division and anger with communal love and harmony. Holiness is not just for the saints, but is given to you through the Holy Spirit. The hands and feet of God in the world are you and your community. The message of God to the world comes through your heart and is visible in your actions performed in holy love. Don't worry, we've only got two verses in chapter five. Paul tells us to reflect God as God's children living a life of love as your life is a fragrant offering. In ancient times, it was generally accepted that fragrant offering 
look to the sky. I'm going to take a little trip from Ephesus to India to give a point. Gandhi wrote that he did not really get street preachers. Think about those who sell roses. You don't need to yell at other people to sell the rose. The rose's fragrance is the only advertisement it needs. Similarly, if you want someone to believe in your faith, your life should exude a fragrance of what you believe in more than your words could. Your life should be so representative of love that you don't need to tell people how good it is. That's not to say don't tell people about your faith, but your service to the world should tell them about your love for God and others. This past Friday, I went to Miss Betty's burial, and one of the things that was so obvious from stories that I heard there, as well as my personal experiences around her, was that she must have lived with abundant love without judgment. Because every time JT and I would go visit her, someone else was already there when we got there, or someone came before we left, or both. There was something in her spirit that made people know that she loved them. And I hope that when I'm 93, or however old is considered old by the time I'm that age, that I've lived a life loving so well that people just want to be around me and take care of me. Miss Betty was not entitled. She did so much work on her property herself, even when people were telling her, get down from that bush hog, you're 80, which is an actual story I heard Friday. And yet, she had both the determination to work and the grace to be taken care of when she eventually couldn't. But when she couldn't work anymore, there was no shortage of people wanting to pay that back to her. I hope I love well enough in my life to create a collection of friends like that, and I wish the same blessing on all of you. Lastly, about Paul. He wrote letters to various churches and cities around the ancient world, yes, telling them when they acted out, but also making, but also asking some of them to emulate the positive traits about the other ones. I think the churches in the ancient world were a bit like us as the body of Christ, in that one of them was able to give generously, one was able to stand up against injustice, one of them was able to create disciples, they all needed each other in order to work in ways that may not have, that they may not have understood on their own. I wonder, how are we in need of communities of faith around us? And how can we be, be good stewards of our resources in the wider community? To figure that out, we are going to need to give up slander, embrace forgiveness, and live in a way that inspires people and lets them know we represent the love of God to the world. I pray that you have the courage, because it takes courage to stand up to slander and injustice, the courage to live out that love in the world, so that people feel God's love in your presence.